so I read an article uh, today, um, part of the Psych Central website sends out a newsletter every two weeks or so with various, they link to blogs and they have a, an ask a therapist section, but they also have links to articles, which I go back and forth on them. Sometimes I feel like they are legitimate and sometimes they don't. And I think that the way that they are dividing their main posts and their news and views posts and then their blogging is kind of, it's a, it's a fuzzy line sometimes and it seems like their main articles which are presented as being there it goes top five news blogs when sometimes what is happening is that in the top five are actually top five blog posts but it gives the impression that the top five are news and they're not um, but this this one came out and the top article is Xanax or clonopin killing you? Um, and I've been taking... Ah, uh, shit. I started on Xanax. And then at some point, I'm not sure when... I think it was... It might have been in Korea, but I'm not sure. Um, it changed to clonazepam. And my parents have both used clonazepam. I think my mother's still does for sleeping, um, which was why I was originally given it for two reasons. For sleeping, because I don't sleep. I have severe insomnia. I don't sleep. Um, but also anxiety. I have quite, I have always had anxiety, and actually my anxiety and compulsive disorders were initially my biggest problems. Um, I was taken out of school because of my severe anxiety disorders. Um, and so, but I, you can't legally medicate someone under the age of 12 in the United States for psychological. It may have changed since I was a kid, but when I was a kid, you couldn't get meds until you were 12. And if, um, but you, and you also had to see a psychologist which was it was ridiculous I really hated him um, and I, I never told him anything um, but yeah so there's there's I'm of two minds about it um, because I feel like my issues are divided half and half. The bipolar is not fun, obviously, but the bipolar alone is not the most dangerous part necessarily for me. The depression part is pretty bad uh, and left unattended will stop my life completely, but day-to-day -day wise the bipolar is not an issue that I have to think about or worry about. My anxiety and panic is. Panic attacks are very real for me and something that I still experience with relative frequency. Um, and my general anxiety rates have been pretty high the past few years. And it was with a sudden spike about two years ago. Just a, and at, at the time, I attributed it to Korea, <laughs> leaving Korea, and coming to Japan and starting and then losing the first job, and it was just a lot of shit happened, and that's kind of what I attributed my anxiety to at the time, that it just got, my life was kind of crazy for a while. But then it didn't go away, even when things settled down, and by the time it got to By the time it got to the beginning of 2013, uh, I was verging on not being able to function. Um, 
when you have severe anxiety, there's a there's a couple things that this article mentioned that I felt were pertinent or worth considering. And one is that anxiety is interpreted differently by different doctors and different patients. Um, if you're going for a more general description of anxiety that people will present and identify as anxiety, doctors and patients alike, it's um, a restlessness, an inability to focus, a sort of vague negative feeling about something. It just, you feel uncomfortable. And discomfort is actually one of the big, I feel uncomfortable. And people will interpret that as anxiety. That's not the same. It's not to say that it's not a, a problem, because it is. Being unable to focus, being unable to be interested or invested in life is a problem. But calling that anxiety may not be the most accurate way of... That might... I personally, I would say that's an attention deficit issue that needs addressing. That's not anxiety. That's unable to focus an inability to focus and a discomfort with the fact that you cannot focus is not the same as severe clinical anxiety. Severe clinical anxiety is characterized very strongly by fear. There is a f intense feeling of fear and if you have a panic disorder in addition to that the anxiety will then trigger a whole cascade of fear and a panic attack. And the panic attack is both psychological and physical. Um, they're a little bit different for everyone, but um, I think the most, the biggest two for me is that I completely go to pieces. I lose it. Within a space of about 10 minutes, I'll start talking to myself very aggressively and very angrily. My voice will raise, I'll get louder. My voice will crack, I will begin to cry. Whatever I am doing, whatever I'm holding, I drop it, I get, I'm on the floor, sobbing hysterically. I just complete loss of composure, completely fall apart, and that can last a while. Um, I think my longest one lasted two hours and I was on the phone with my friend Sharon for two and a half hours <laughs> uh, and and then when it's over which is usually just characterized by me being able to stand up again um, at some point I shout. I do, like, before I start crying, I start screaming. Um, I get very, very angry right before the fear sets in. Um, and, and then when it's over, it's kind of like you spend all of your feelings in one go. So for quite a while afterwards, you're just empty. You have spent every feeling you have to feel is just gone. No reserves. So you're flat. You're tired. You don't feel well. Uh, they're pretty horrifying. And when I have a really bad one, sometimes it takes me more than a day to recover from that. It takes me more than a day to start feeling again because I've spent them all in one go. Um, and in early January of last year, I had been sick for a very long time. Um, it started in the previous August when things kind of settled a bit and I seemed to be doing okay and my doctor suggested that we try not doing the anxiety meds for a while 
and see if perhaps that was a symptom of a mania that was popping up and maybe we should adjust the low amygdala and see if we can cut back on the benzodiazepine, my, my clonazepam. That was not a good idea. Uh, I had immediate severe drug withdrawal. I'm not on that high of a dose and even taking it down we tried to take it down a quarter and it was no my blood pressure dropped dramatically to the point where when I tried to sleep one night and I took my meds and the meds that get me to sleep I've been taking I had been taking half of them because I was worried and I had to force myself to stay awake because I kept having to remind myself to breathe, which is obviously not good. So my blood pressure dropped dramatically, and the very next day, it was very difficult to get to my doctor because I got very tired just trying to stand. I was dizzy, weak, um, and so I got to his office and I walked into the reception area and I just said, oh, I feel terrible. <laughs> and she went, the nurse went, what's wrong? And I went, we'd stopped this med and I have felt awful. I can't stand for very long. <laughs> and so she took me in the back and took my blood pressure or tried. It was so low that it took her well, the first three times that she tried to take my blood pressure, it didn't register. It was that low. And then she finally got it to register by putting a hot towel over my arm for ten minutes and then coming back. And finally got it to register. It's really fucking low. When she couldn't get it the first three times, she interrupted my doctor. She knocked on the door and went into his office while he had another patient was like, There's a problem out here. <laughs> so he put me back on it on the regular dose. And as soon as I had the regular dose, I was fine. So I'm very obviously dependent on this chemical. It's not something that I can easily stop taking. Um, but after that, things got kind of mm, tricky and I got sick. I got the flu and then it kind of was a cold and then a sinus infection that never really went away and then that turned into asthma of all things. I developed fucking asthma as an adult because I was sick for basically for almost four months I was sick and I started to notice things so the, when the blood pressure became an issue I got really worried about what that actually meant so of course I did the stupid thing and googled my symptoms and I came up with two, they kept saying, you're diabetic. And I was like, fuck me. If I'm diabetic, I am killing myself because I am terrified of needles. And if I have to do insulin or prick my, no, I'd rather die. I'd rather die. So, that's, no. So I sent an email to my mom because I was like, do we even have this in our family? Like, is this something I need to worry about? Because I know I have to worry about cancer. And I have to worry about strokes, because those run in my family. But, like, is diabetes a thing in our family? Because I don't remember anybody having diabetes. And she said, well, your aunt did, but that's because her kidneys failed. Your great aunt. And then she said, your grandma does, but that's because of cancer. So, <laughs> so not, not genetically. We don't have that in our family. But then she said, but we do have thyroid problems. And it turns out my mother and three of her four sisters and her mother all have hypothyroidism and all were diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 26. And I was 24 at the time that this was happening. So I thought, oh, well, I started reading up on that and just kept going, well, I have that symptom and that one. And that one. Okay, so I have I have almost all of the symptoms. <laughs> Weird nails, uh, slow healing, physical healing, uh, low immune system, uh, 
unusual weight gain or weight loss, and most noticeably, shockingly high anxiety. Um, winter break, so January 2013, I was a wreck. I was a complete mess. I could not do anything. I was just doing anything was too difficult for me. I felt emotionally incapable of doing anything. I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't write. I couldn't read. I just trying to do anything immediately triggered a panic attack. So, what I've done or have learned to do as part of my coping, I can't sit on my arms and stuff. One of my coping mechanisms is physical. If I can get myself a project for my hands and just have something to do here, then it won't matter so much that I can't do anything here. So, I went out and I got a bunch of Tamari shit. And it's just. If you saw my Facebook, you're like, Jesus, bitch. I must have made 20 of the damn things in the first month that I learned how to make them because I needed something to do with my hands and they are completely crafted. And I got very good at them, but I haven't done them since this all got addressed. So I started doing that to just get through the break. I had to get through it somehow. I went to three doctors to get the hypothyroid. First I went to see my psychiatrist and said, I think this is a thing and I think we need to check for it. And he said, okay, sure. So we did the blood test and it came back normal, kind of. When they test for thyroid problems, they test two hormones, TS3 and TS4. And In order to be diagnosed with hypothyroidism, you need to have less than a certain amount of these hormones present in your blood to count. Um, there's a there's this a range, a scale of what is considered normal. So I fell on the normal scale. I was at the very bottom, but still normal, which threw me. However, there was another clue in the blood test. My cholesterol was high. At the time of the test, I was 24. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't eat really well, but I don't eat badly. Why do I have high cholesterol? High cholesterol unusually high cholesterol for the person in question is a symptom of hypothyroidism. So, there we have our first clue. In that test we see I don't fall into the scale of non-functioning thyroid but something is weird. So I went to another doctor, a regular GP, and said we did a test but the test didn't really conclusively go one way or the other. And I, I don't... I, I did some research between seeing the second doctor, between seeing my doctor and the second doctor, and my research popped up several articles that said that the scale used to measure proper thyroid function was not well created because what they did was they took a statistical range of people and just said okay this is we for example we got a hundred people and in these hundred people this was the highest number and this was the lowest number which is how you would make a range except they forgot to account for people with thyroid problems. So they didn't eliminate people with thyroid problems. So people with thyroid problems still counted towards that 
normal range number. So that range is pretty fucking meaningless because they didn't exclude for pre-existing thyroid conditions when making the scale. So there's a lot of people who don't fall into the hypothyroid range because the scale isn't right. Um, so I took that and went, okay, so there's a possibility that my test actually does say what I think I am, and it's just that the doctor's not up to date with the literature, which, you know, it's not his field. He's psychiatry. He's not thyroid stuff. So I said, yes, you know, it's not his thing. Maybe he's just, and I didn't want to be like, hey, dude, read your literature. So... <laughs> I went to a different doctor and said, you know, this is a thing that I'm worried about. And he did the same test. And even though I said, we did this test and this, these were the results, he did the same test and got the same results and told me the same thing, that, no, I don't have hypothyroidism, it's all in my head. And then I went to an actual thyroid hospital, because I went, no, 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 fuck this noise. I'm going to someone who this is their job. I'm going to go. So I went to the thyroid hospital in Montesando and spent six hours there. I got all the tests done. They, This is such a fucking mess. Like, I can't believe that after everything that we did that day, that I walked out of there without a diagnosis. And let me tell you why. They did the blood test and they got the same results. And I pointed out the cholesterol thing to them, and they went, yeah, that is kind of strange, and then just sort of ignored it. So I just cat hair stuck to my face for some reason, and it's... <sighs> cat what? Um, so I pointed it out, and they were like, oh, blah, blah, blah. They, they didn't care. And then I mentioned the papers that I'd read. So they weren't just like blog articles. We're talking peer-reviewed journal articles that I found. So what about this? And they went, no, no, no. They also did an ultrasound on my thyroid. And here is what they told me. Your thyroid has many small cysts on it, but is otherwise normal. It's deformed but otherwise normal. It's covered in cysts, but it's normal. That doesn't sound terribly normal to me. Glands shouldn't have cysts all over them if they're healthy. And if it's covered in cysts, and I have high cholesterol, and I have pretty much every symptom of this, I think it's safe to say that it's time to medicate the symptoms and not the test results. They disagreed with me, and I walked out not only without a diagnosis, but without any sort of medication or direction as to where to go next. So. I found an American doctor, doctor who is licensed to practice in the United States and in Japan. He's half. I went to see him. I brought all my literature with me. I brought all my tests with me. I brought all my family history with me. I sat down. I said, here's the thing. I think I have this thing and everything except these two numbers, the TS and the T4, say I have it, but these numbers don't. And he said, uh-huh, so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to try medication. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't work, I'll move on, but I need to try it, otherwise I'll never know, and it could get worse. And it did. So, so he gave me the meds, and it was fucking magical. Within a week, 
my anxiety decreased 70 80 percent huge amount gone uh, my health improved. I finally got rid of my cold. The asthma stayed, but the cold went away. I started healing. Like, I'd cut myself cooking or something. Like, just small injuries didn't heal. It was, I don't know, it was not good. Later on, I had to up the dosage for all of that. Because what happens is, when your, when your thyroid starts to die, all your hormone levels drop and then when you start to substitute with synthetic hormone your thyroid kind of gives up it goes oh there's plenty of this in here so I don't need to be making any of it and then shuts down completely so you have to bump the dosage up after a couple months because your thyroid completely dies after that point point. and fortunately we caught it before it completely died or else I would have been in big trouble but this last month, at some point, I ran out of meds, and I just didn't have time, and I didn't remember to get more. And it wasn't until last week that I really realized I was a wreck. I was kind of a mess, just falling apart, panic attacks left and right, just not having a good time of it. And I got to my doctor, and I told him what had happened, so I, my, I've had three panic attacks this week, it's just been a disaster. And, and I went, and I've been out of meds for a while. And he went, stop. <laughs> Why did you run out of meds? I just, I ran out, and I didn't have time, and I forgot. And he said, no, 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 no. Your anxiety is part of this. You have to take these. We can't address any of your anxiety issues until we know that this part of them is being taken care of. And you just told me it's not. So, take your meds and come back to me. <laughs> and he was right. After, like, after two days, I felt better. I had a cut on the back of my hand here, that you can kind of see, that was all the way across this knuckle on on Monday it was all the way across on fuck on Thursday it was halfway across it was twice as big as this and it's Monday now and it's barely there the next day it was half the size like your body stops doing everything without the fact so now I'm in a position where I still have anxiety issues. I have anxiety and I have panic attacks. And I take the benzodiazepines knowing that a certain amount of my anxiety now is related to the fact that my thyroid is dead. So backing off of the benzodiazepines could be a good idea, could be a terrible idea. Yet I don't know how much of the anxiety is what anymore. I still have a panic disorder. So there aren't really very good ways to treat that. <laughs> like this this article, that was my main issue with this article, is that it talks about getting patients off of benzodiazepines, but then it doesn't offer any alternatives. Like at all. It just says you, sh you shouldn't take them because you'll get dependent on them, which is true about just about every medication that is prescribed for mental disorder. When you have a mood disorder, you get pretty fucking dependent on your shit. Because your brain needs it. So, have studies shown benzodiazepines could be problematic? Yeah, yeah they have, but until you give me something else to work with, I think I have to take the option that will keep me alive. Like, <laughs> 
I can't have panic attacks every day. I will die. <laughs> the level of non-functioning that I become would eventually result in my death. I know this to be true. It sounds a bit dramatic, but I know this to be true. So, I can potentially die younger or probably die now. Not really good options there. Not some great choices. So, yeah. Am I dependent on benzodiazepines? Yes. Am I addicted? Absolutely. Is there a solution to that? Not the way I'm seeing it. Because at this point, the addiction for me is a much it's only a problem much further down the line. Right now, I gotta do what I gotta do. So, until science steps up the game a bit and gives me something better, that's all I got. And I swear to God, if anybody, oh God, if anybody suggests homeopathy to me one more time, I will cut a bitch. I was working this week doing summer camps and this this woman that I <laughs> talked to, she she was supposed to teach with us on Monday and she called us Monday morning while we were gathering with the children from the train station bathroom and I was the only one that knew which bathroom she was in so I went and she was having such severe period pain she couldn't stand well I've been there so I gave her all my ibuprofen and we told I made sure she was gonna be able to get home safe and then we I went back and was like she's not coming today we cannot make her come today that's not gonna work so we just divvied up her students and we went on our way and then the next day she was like were you the one that came I was like, yeah she's thinking so later on that day I got a flashbulb to the face which I never enjoy because the has about a 60% chance of triggering a migraine for me. So I always tell people with cameras, no flash please, turn off the flash. I cannot do flash. Do not flash in my face. I got a flash full on in the face and was not happy about it. And she, when she asked why that was a problem, because Japanese people always, they don't understand migraines. They always say that I have weak eyes. It's not my eyes that's the problem. It's actually a seizure. So, but I can't really explain that. I can't be like, they give me headaches. Because that's not really going into what a migraine really is. Migraine is more than a headache. Migraine is a seizure. It's an electrical storm in your brain that's incredibly uncomfortable and painful and... I do not wish them on anyone. So I said, Well, I get you know, I get migraines from them. And she went, Oh, you know what? I bet you could I bet you could take something for that. Yeah, I do, actually. I take uh I take immigrant when I have one. She goes, No, 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 like I bet you could change your change your diet and, and fix that. And I went, well, it's a genetic thing. My mother, my father, my grandfather, two of my grandmothers. Most of the people in my family get them. We all started getting them about 12 or 13 years old, right? And we consistently have similar triggers. Like, it's 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 genetic for us. It's it's not diet. She goes, well, you know, you never know what, what kind of what kind of uh, herbs can, sh you know, I bet you could knock that gene right out. And I had to walk away because if I stayed there any longer, I would have voiced what was in my mind, which was, there is not a diet in the world that can change your DNA. I will repeat, there is not a diet in the world short of consuming plutonium that will change your DNA. Lady, you can go all gluten-free to manage your periods if that's what you want to do. But don't tell me 
that science tells you gluten will change your DNA. Science is not that hard, people. It's really not. In any event, homeopathy is not an option. <laughs> like the people who say homeopathy has helped with your mood disorders were maybe weren't dealing with the same kind of level of mood disorder. Like people are always like, oh you know, I take melatonin to sleep. Okay, cool. So you have a little bit of a problem with either inducing sleep or just telling your body when it's time to sleep is a problem for you. Melatonin is released when you're gonna go to sleep. So melanin, melatonin is melatonin. It never worked for me. And I'll tell you why it never worked for me. Because my brain doesn't work that way. When left to my own devices completely naturally, I go to sleep at about 4 a.m. and I get up at 2 p.m. That's my natural sleep cycle and it has been that way most of my life. Left to my own devices, my body runs a 10 hour cycle, 4 a.m. to 2 p.m. All year round, no matter what I'm eating, no matter what time I get in bed, no matter if, if left to my own devices, that's how I sleep. And that's not a good way to sleep. If you plan on living in a daytime society. So, I don't take medication just to calm down before sleep. I take medicine to shut my body down. I take antipsychotic medication because its primary function is to shut you down. I have also taken this exact same medication during a severe panic attack to shut it down. It turns your body off. That's what it does. Everything is dropped down a level. It stops, it doesn't stop the psychological panic attack, but it does stop the physiological symptoms, which make it easier to calm down. It makes it easier to get through the panic attack if you're not hyperventilating, if you're not shaking, if you're not crying, if you're not nauseous. If you can turn all that off, it's easier to get through. I take my psychotic, antipsychotic medicine before I go to sleep because it slows my heart rate slows my breathing rate, it calms, I might, my brain just starts to turn things off, click, 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 click. So am I drugging myself to sleep? Yes, I am. Do I need to do it? Yeah, I do. I have tried your melatonin, I have tried your St. John's wort, I have tried your Lunesta, I have tried your Ambien. Ambien can die in a fire. I took half the dose I was prescribed and I hallucinated vividly and it was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. No, thank you. I tried one more that I don't even remember, but I remember immediately returning to the doctor and saying, I am not taking that ever again because it gave me cluster headaches, which I'd never had in my life. I had three mini migraines in one day. This is getting long, but it's just, this article just made me angry. Like, you don't need to tell me that taking all of these pills is in the long run probably not very good on my body. But the thing is, you're not balancing it against the reality of the issue that I have mood disorders, severe ones which could potentially result in me taking my own life if left untreated. 
So yeah, my kidneys might give out by the time I'm 40. But if I wasn't taking them, I'd have been dead about six years ago. So I don't know. I just, I'd rather be addicted and alive. I think that's what it comes down to. I would always rather be addicted and be alive. <laughs> I'd rather be addicted and functioning. I'd rather be addicted and able to lead a life, which I can. So, I'm probably fucking up my organs, but I gotta worry about that when it comes. I I just gotta hope that science keeps on plugging and can figure something out by the time I get there. I think generally these medications are safe. Like the numbers that we're talking about of potential death are ridiculously small. Even this article admitted it that while benzodiazepines, according to one study, could potentially double your risk of death, we're talking about a 1% death off benzodiazepines becoming a 2% death on benzodiazepines. So a small number doubled is still a very small number and is quite statistically difficult to to sort of make any point with, but I know what they were going for, I think. It's just I felt like there wasn't a lot of it felt like fear mongering a bit. Oh, you should be scared of you need to talk to your doctor. You don't let your doctor give you these. Don't start taking these. They never help. They do help, or nobody would take them. Just because they don't help in the way that you want them to help. Just because medicine is not magically something that you won't be addicted to. An addiction is not necessarily a horrible, horrible thing. Addiction is just a physical need for a chemical. And my brain doesn't make the right chemicals in the right amounts for the right amount of time. So no matter what, no matter what I take, I want to be addicted to it because that means that my brain is using it. If I take something for my mood to control neurotransmitters and I'm not addicted to it, I have a hard time believing it's doing anything. If that makes sense. I have a hard time believing that something designed to affect my synapse firing, if I can stop taking that cold turkey no problem, how do I know it's doing anything to start? It seems highly unlikely that it would be able to instantaneously change the process and then instantaneously be removed with no issue. That doesn't make sense. I should be addicted to it. Addiction is a need, a requirement. I should be. So I guess I just take issue with the fact that addiction is automatically a terrible thing. I think it depends strongly on what you're addicted to, why you're addicted to it, and whether or not addiction is necessarily an immediate problem. Because I don't think it is in many cases. Not for mood disorders. Obviously, this doesn't apply to alcohol or drugs of, you know, recreational drugs. I don't know. I don't... Well, I know alcohol abuse. <laughs> I'm Irish. <laughs> I have cousins. <laughs> cousins and great aunts. There's some alcohol dependence in my family. Believe it or not. Not in my immediate family. Yet. <laughs> I'm not putting any money on some people. Um, but no, I mean, obviously... I'm speaking very specifically about mood-altering medication and being addicted. That I don't necessarily believe addiction to a mood-altering medication is is quintessentially negative. I think that's kind of an unpopular opinion. I guess I just don't... I'm not afraid of chemicals the way some people are. Some people freak out. You're taking 
Oh my god, you take all these medication medication yeah, because my body doesn't work right. I saw there's a great comic going around that is shows different scenes of how ridiculous it would be if people treated physical injuries the same way they treat mood disorders and mental illness. So it's like a guy with a gushing blood arm and someone's saying like, oh, well, have you tried... Was... Oh no, it was somebody... <laughs> somebody... somebody had cancer and they said, well, have you tried not having cancer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I fucking tried. Well, have you tried thinking positively? Yeah, yeah, I fucking tried that too. And you know what? It didn't work. You can't will away illness. So, mental illness is a disease. Mental illness is a deficit within the body. Mental illness is something doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. It's, in my mind, not dissimilar to some sort of deformity. It's for me, it's some I was born this way. I was born with an internal structural deformity. My brain doesn't do synapses right. It doesn't do it right. And now it doesn't do thyroids right. And that's that's my body. That's what I gotta deal with. I messed up bones, I got messed up brains, I got a messed up thyroid. It's a fun time. Oh, and lungs now, too. I have an inhaler. That's super exciting. So. Mental illness is called illness because it is. And you treat illness with medicine. And... You wouldn't tell someone with the flu, oh no, no, don't take that Tamiflu. You need, I mean, your body gets really, mm, really attached to that, that flu medicine. You don't tell them, I mean, you, somebody has cancer. Oh no, no, you shouldn't take that radiation. It's very bad for you. Well, yeah, it is pretty bad for you. But you know what's worse for you? Cancer. What do you think is going to kill him sooner? Chemo or cancer? I'm betting on cancer. So, hmm. I'm not sure why. This is almost an hour long. <laughs> I guess, hmm. I don't know. What do you guys think? I guess, having been medicated for so long, in so many different ways, with so many different diagnoses, until I finally developed to now. I don't want to be without medication. When I was... When I was 19, I went off everything. And I was off for a year and a half. And for a year, I seemed to be okay. And I thought, oh, cool, I'm one of those few people that finished puberty and everything got fixed. <laughs> and then I crashed. And I did not leave my house for th almost four months. I went to work and nowhere else. I did not go to school. I did not go see friends. I went home and I went to work. And that was it. And that was not a good way to handle things. And I developed panic attacks every time I tried to go to school. And that's when I started taking medication again. And I finished university. <laughs> And after that, I think I understood better 
why I needed to be on medication and why I needed to stay on medication and that this isn't something that will heal itself or go away with time. That this is an, a handicap. My brain is broken. It sucks, but it is what it is. And I have to accept that. For now. <laughs> Come on, science! Come on! Fix it for me, science! Make it all go away. They'll figure it out. Hopefully soon. Not because I'd mind taking medicine, but it's kind of expensive. Also, I might be pickling my kidneys. I don't drink, though, so maybe they'll be okay. I don't know, I guess. I just still feel like I would rather be taking medication and addicted to it than be dead. So there's your two cents from Kaylee today. What would Kaylee rather? Would Kaylee rather be on medication or off? On. Because if I'm off, I'm dead. It's as simple as that. So I don't ever want to be on. Fifty-one minutes. Okay, I'm gonna end this. Bye.